Hi, this is Mike Thomas from Managing Energy with a quick overview of the Ontario electricity market. I'll start out with some history, then describe the players and what they do. From there, I'll talk about how they are paid, what that means for your monthly bills, and how this year is different from the past. At the end, I'll talk about further changes on the horizon. Electricity is a regulated industry. It is considered a necessity, so the government has a job of making sure that everyone gets the electricity they need when they need it at a reasonable price. Without effective regulation, you get what you see in the third world, where electricity is a luxury and available only intermittently. This is also a business where the cost of the product goes up without central oversight. So who should pay? Should it be the electricity consumer? Or should it be the taxpayer? People hate high electricity bills, but they don't want the costs hidden in their taxes either. Informed people generally agree that the cost of supplying electricity should be paid by users rather than taxpayers. This is the principle behind the market restructuring that began in Ontario 12 years ago. Unfortunately, the user pays principle is subject to ongoing political interference because the average voter has only a hazy understanding of the competing factors. Until restructuring began, politicians were avoiding tough choices by putting off much of the cost of future rate payers and taxpayers to deal with. Remember that this kid in the orange shirt, he'll be back. The more exposed the electrical system is to politics, the worse it is for everybody in the end. For decades, Ontario's electrical system was run by a public corporation called Ontario Hydro, subject to direct political interference. That proved to be inefficient and passed too much cost to taxpayers, especially future taxpayers. Things looked good for many years as Ontario Hydro accumulated debt, but when Ontario Hydro was restructured in 1999, the province inherited $38 billion in debt and only $17 billion in assets. The remaining $21 billion was unfunded or stranded. This amount is being paid down gradually with rate riders on electrical bills, but there is still over $15 billion remaining 12 years later. The young boy in the orange shirt is not as carefree as he used to be. Now for the market structure. The North American electrical grid has been called the most complicated machine ever built, and the business of running it is also very complicated. There are three main groups of market participants. First, the generators who produce the power. These include companies that burn fossil fuels or capture heat from nuclear fusion or use water flows or harness wind and solar power. That group is expanding to include small local generators and even individual households. Generation is a competitive industry in Ontario. Customers can contract from a particular generator if they want to, although most buy from the default mix of generators supplying them through the grid. The largest single generator in Ontario is Ontario Power Generation, accounting for 61% of the production in 2010. The second group of market participants is the transmitters, who move the electricity at very high voltage from the large generators to the areas where the power is consumed. These participants are responsible to provide and maintain the network of towers and high-tension wires across the province. In Ontario, most of that infrastructure is owned and operated by Hydro One. Finally, distributors move the electricity from the transmission grid to the end users. In Ontario, there are 72 electrical distributors, known as Local Distribution Companies, or LDCs. Most customers receive a single monthly bill from an LDC who also collects money for the generators and transmitters. And on top of all this are the regulators. The independent electri electricity system operator is the regulator of daily operations. It exchanges information among participants, ensures that supply matches demand, and makes sure that everyone gets credited and paid for their contribution. From hour to hour, it operates much like a stock exchange as the primary buyer of electricity. Every five minutes, the IESO forecasts consumption in the province and uses a reverse auction process to collect the best offers from generators to provide the required electricity. The Ontario Energy Board is the strategic regulator which tries to balance the interests of the various market participants in the public interest. The OEB dictates policies and procedures for the market players, shown in this diagram, and also sets fundamental pricing. It also authorizes market participants through a licensing system. Market participants apply to the OEB for charges outside the provincial standard rates to account for their particular circumstances. The last regulator, the Ontario Power Authority, can be thought of as the delivery arm of the OEB. Where the OEB sets policy and pricing, the OPA is mandated to put the policy into action by planning the electricity system and procuring the resources to execute the plan. 
This includes managing renewable energy and conservation programs. Governments and regulators realize that electricity is a necessity and, and that it is a significant budget item for most families and businesses. That makes it politically sensitive. In addition, the regulators also want to encourage conservation. These two considerations encourage transparency in the billing process, which makes utility bills different from most other expenditures. The supply chain costs are largely exposed, and that makes the bills very complicated. Despite this complexity, it pays to understand them at least a little bit. I'm going to take some time now to explain the details of electricity billing to Ontario consumers as of July 2011. Billing structures have changed significantly in the past two years and will change further for many consumers in 2011 and 2012. A tiered regulated price plan currently applies to most households and small business consumers in the province. The first part of the bill is the commodity charge, the money sent to the generators, which accounts for just over half of the bill total. In each month, the first block of consumption is charged at 6.8 cents per kilowatt hour. Anything above that block is charged at 7.9 cents per kilowatt hour. The more electricity you use, the more you pay. The price for each kilowatt hour is not affected by exactly when you use it. Except for some regulatory charges, the remainder of the bill is account, accounted for by payments for transmission and distribution. These transmission and distribution charges also vary with consumption. So instead of 6.8 cents, the typical household actually pays closer to 12 cents for each kilowatt hour of consumption when all the market participants are paid. Electricity marketers can only offer alternate pricing for generation. So even if you contract with them, you still have to pay for transmission and distribution. Those marketers often play on the difference between the generated price and the delivered price to confuse consumers. As a final detail, the tier levels change twice a year on May 1st and November 1st. The upper tier kicks in sooner in the summer. I'm going to digress for a moment to introduce the challenge of variability in power production. The profile of electricity consumption is not flat through the day. More is used in the middle of the day than in the middle of the night. Because there is essentially no storage in the system, Generating sources have to be brought on in the morning and shut down in the evening to follow the changing load. It is the job of the IESO to make sure this happens. The reverse auction market operates to get the best available price at all times. Generating sources with the lowest marginal cost will come on first, followed by more expensive sources once the low-cost sources become fully committed. In this diagram, we can see that hydroelectric and nuclear power supply the base load in Ontario. Other sources have to be brought on in the morning and then shut down again in the evening to satisfy the daily peak. The point I want to make here is that it costs more to generate electricity during the day than at night, sometimes several times more. If we want to preserve the principle of cost causality, meaning users should cover their own costs and should not be paying for others, then it makes sense to charge more for electricity used during the day and less at night. Returning now to pricing, we saw that the tiered RPP tariff does not reflect the changing cost of generation through the day. Traditional meters can only capture accumulated usage between readings without regard to when each unit of energy was actually used. In order to collect timing information, the OEB has mandated that all the LDCs in the province replace the old meters with modern smart meters, which record usage at least every hour. From there, all consumers are to be converted to time of use billing, a process that was supposed to be completed by 2011. At present, the meters are mostly installed, though only a minority of small consumers served by some of the larger LDCs are actually on time of use billing. Most LDCs are well behind schedule. The electricity commodity price under the time of use regulated price plan is based on three usage periods shown in the graphic, with the price nearly doubling between off-peak and on-peak periods. Once again, the commodity cost represents just over half of the total bill. The remainder is accounted for by payments for transmission and distribution and regulatory charges, which are calculated the same way as under the RPP tiered tariff. In winter, the expensive peak periods are weekday mornings and evenings when residential electric heat and appliances are used the most. Weekends and statutory holidays are entirely off-peak. On-peak and mid-peak periods reverse in summer to reflect the effect of air conditioning on the daily load profile. Consumers will save money by avoiding use through the middle of the day in summer and in the early morning and evening over the winter. 
So this is the rate schedule that all small users will be switched to in the near future. The OEB will make adjustments to these three unit costs to reflect changes in the cost of generation and to encourage everyone to shift their usage to off-peak periods. That covers off the two rate tariffs for small users. I'm going to take a sidetrack once again to deal with another wrinkle. When the restructured market opened in 1999, the planners expected that the prices in the competitive wholesale market would settle in a way that would make it attractive for investors to build new generating capacity. Any shortfall would drive wholesale prices up, creating an incentive to invest. It didn't work out that way. Existing low-cost generators found that they could compete effectively at their marginal cost of production, a cost that was too low to encourage new production capacity. With the recession of 2009, demand declined so there was plenty of existing capacity. The market price moved downward. The wholesale market has proven inadequate for new generators to recover their fixed capital costs. In 2005, the OEB established the Global Adjustment to fund support payments to generators, covering the shortfall between their cost of production and the price they can get on the wholesale market. When the wholesale market price goes up, the shortfall is less and the global adjustment goes down. The global adjustment increases when the market price drops. As new generators with long-term contracts have come online, this part of the bill has risen sharply as wholesale pricing has fallen. On the chart, you can see that the continual rise of the red global adjustment line. Among the generating sources subsidized through global adjustment are renewable generation, so that's wind, solar, and biomass, and conservation programs. For RPP customers, the global adjustment is buried in the consumption charges. It accounts for the difference between the wholesale price, which is typically two to five cents per kilowatt hour, and the much higher unit costs discussed earlier. Small customers are not directly exposed to the monthly volatility of either the wholesale market or the global adjustment in the same way as large customers, which are discussed next. Commercial and industrial customers which include all buildings larger than a small elementary school, pay a different rate. Most of these customers are referred to as Class B. Virtually all of these customers now have smart meters. The commodity charge is based on hourly time of use matched against pricing on the wholesale market. This example shows a small commercial building in eastern Ontario on a hot summer day. The demand between 3 a.m. and 3 p.m. increased by four times, but the commodity cost increased by 130 times. For these customers, the global adjustment is a line item on the bill, calculated on monthly usage volume and changing each month according to what happens in the wholesale market. As with the other tariffs, transmission and distribution charges are added as well. The last customer category are the Class A customers, the very large industrial and commercial users with 5 megawatts peak demand or more. These customers also have smart meters and are billed the same way as Class B customers with one important exception. As of 2011, the global adjustment for Class A customers will be based on their proportional share of the provincial electrical consumption during the five highest hours of Ontario demand all year. That creates a very strong incentive for those customers to anticipate and avoid consuming electricity during those five hours whenever they might be. It means that approximately half of their annual electrical co commodity cost will be based on consumption during only five hours. Based on recent wholesale market prices, that implies that the smallest Class A customer running a three-shift operation could avoid over $1 million in electricity costs by shutting down for those five hours. The early response to this new pricing scheme will be seen in the summer of 2011 when the peak hours will be established. So what's next? Some of what's coming is known and some is an educated guess. With an election in October, the de details are subject to political manipulation, but the direction is clear. On the user side, Class A customers will take steps to reduce their consumption aggressively during the hottest days. This will shift more of the global adjustment onto smaller customers. As coal-fired generation is retired, replacement capacity, including renewables and conservation, will, will come on stream. The difference between these high capital cost forms of generation and the market price will add to the global adjustment. Maintenance of the transmission and distribution networks has been underfunded for decades so the infrastructure is old. Expect increasing and vocal submission to the OEB for rate increases to fund asset renewal. And transition to a smart grid. 
Regulators are pushing changes to grid infrastructure to give all participants, including consumers, more information to make informed decisions. Smart meters are the first step, but there's a lot more possible as we're introduced to community level and household level generation, electric cars, automated demand response, and so forth. A smart grid overlays two-way communication technology on top of the existing grid, and it will have to be paid in some way. It's hard to escape the conclusion that electricity prices will continue to rise in Ontario. Even the politicians are estimating a 30% real price increase over the next five years. Thank you for watching, and please leave any comments on our website or the site where this video was posted.